Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Sports Community live stream. As we're doing every Wednesday for the next uh, four weeks, including today, we're doing doing sport differently. And today, I am really pleased to be joined by Chris Wall from the Frankston Stingrays Hockey Club. Chris, welcome to Sports Community live stream. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for hosting me in this otherwise weird time. <laughs> Well, in a, in a normal time, we would have probably, what have we, separated ourselves by maybe 10 kilometres. So in another time, yeah. we would have just got in the car and, I don't know, go to Frankston Pier and, and done it from the, the beautiful surrounds of Frankston Pier. But uh, <laughs> the new world we live in is um, we do it remotely. But when it comes to participation, the world is changing dramatically. And I was... I'm not laughing at all your titles, but you're vice president of the Frankston Stingrays Hocking Club, the inclusions ambassador, which we'll come back to, more traditional role, men's coordinator, and as most people become at a sports club, you're the barbecue operator extraordinaire. So yeah. what about eight well, different... Someone, someone might fight me for the barbecue title, but I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll be happy to relinquish all the other ones and let me have them. <laughs> so before we go into what Frankston Stingrays Hockey Club have done um, from a participation option, social sport and modified formats. Just take us through the role of inclusion ambassador because it's a, it's a relatively unique role within the club. Yeah, so I guess it probably starts with Hockey Victoria uh, and the story goes back to a Victorian hockey player who really started sort of, I guess he came out um, openly as, as a, a gay sports person and was really proud about it. His hockey club then supported him through that and then you end up things like Pride Cup, um, Pride Round and there's all different variations and hockey has always been... I guess it's it's always been an inclusive sport. It didn't matter where you came from, what you did. You didn't have to be massive or built like a footy player. You didn't have to be super fast to be the best. Um, and it was always men's and women's. There was never yeah. a push to make women's more. It was always a ma male-female sport. So yeah. it sort of felt you know, it's nat a natural progression from Hockey Victorias. Um, and the player was Gus... Um, Gus, my foot's great. Sorry, it's escaped me. But they started this big movement and, and it really changed... I guess, my view on what an inclusive and, and community sports club could be. Um, and it went from just educating myself about you know, um, the LGBTQI community uh, and understanding, you know, language that was used in the past, it's inappropriate now, then educating my fellow team members and, you know, men's sports can be quite sort of a lot of bravado and the, the language yeah. used it isn't appropriate anymore. So it was just about sort of just pulling people up in a nice way saying, hey, you know what, we, we don't want to be that kind of club. This is the culture we want. We want people to join in and feel welcome and safe. Um, you know, there's enough challenges in the world for those who are sort of a minority community and we want to make them not feel like a minority. We want to bring them into the majority and make them feel welcome, have them understand that everyone is normal at hockey. Everyone, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you believe in, you know, who you love or how you how you how you dance or whatever it is, what you wear, everyone, when you put on the Frankston uniform, we're all the same. We're all just hockey lovers having a good time. So that developed. Um, Michaela Cook at Hockey Victoria started um, she, she basically to look at basically the inclusions officer at Hockey Victoria, I think her title is. And then it stemmed from there. And then we um, we sort of just allocated a role. I sort of took it on as a new role and um, and really opened up my eyes as to to how we can be a better sporting club without having to change a number of things. And we took a bit of a gamble in a sense that we can see, which oh, to reverse on our left sleeve, we have our the pride flag there um, that Hockey Victoria used. And that was more about us just wearing and I guess putting our money where our mouth is, saying that, yes, we can say we're going to do it. Now we're going to visualise we're going to do it. And people recognise that from within those communities. Uh, and now that we're a better educated club, I, I really believe that it's made a massive difference in making everyone feel welcome. The culture's changed. And that's also stems to Indigenous communities, um, sports, Rec Victoria, uh, yes, ooh, yeah, Rec Link Victoria. Um, they do some sports with, with, with players with disabilities um, of, of all nature. Um, and we did some hockey programs down there. There's a great uh, event down at Frankston Football Club, the VFL field down there. And then uh, Rec Link did a little day down. We took some hockey stuff down there and I had people with mental and physical disabilities join in. And it was really great watching everyone play a sport that I've played for 15 years but never seen this cohort of people join in. So it was good to teach them hockey and it just flo flowed from there. Now it's just if we we try better to understand who we have in our club um, and make them feel welcome. 
that's long yeah. story short. We should have started with that. <laughs> Would have saved no. 15 minutes of a ramble. <laughs> no, no, it's only five. So, But I think it's very important that you've identified a much maligned group of people that are continually discriminated against in our community, which is mm. those that can't dance, right? So... Uh, <laughs> Guilty, uh, got the bad uh, news. <laughs> but just going quickly, so you know, you picked that up from a hockey Victoria um, program, and and one of the things that clubs don't recognise uh, is that the peak sporting bodies offer a lot of different programs for a lot of different reasons, particularly yeah. around participation. And so you you and well, Frankston Stingrays Hockey Club introduced two programs, uh, the uh, the J Ball and the Hockey Sixes. So tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about a uh, why you did that and what those programs were and who are they looking to attract? Yeah, so again, back to our, our, our governing body, if you like, Hockey Victoria. Um, they were and Vic Health as well. So there's a number of different sort of parties involved in that in making, I guess, um, an all access format of the sport that we so traditionally love as hockey. Um, how do we, it can be this with sport, I guess there's a commitment. You've got to pay fees. You've got to sign up to a season. You've got training, you've got equipment, you've got uniform, you've got functions and events. Not everybody wants to do that, nor does everybody have the, the financial sort of acumen or, to, to, or, or budget to put that in there to make it happen or, or just the time. They could be time poor. So through that, um, Hockey Vid came up with J-Ball, and a hockey sixes program. There's always been similar things ran, but never really formalised. And not all clubs could, I guess, sort of really fit that into their season. And we sort of had a chat with them, and it was started at a couple of other clubs up north. And we're probably one of the most southern clubs in the state, so we took it on down south and ran that out at uh, Monash Peninsula campus in Frankston. And we bought um, Hockey Vic in, and they all they all supported us. And we went got a, a grant through um, Vic Health, so the Vic government. Sports Rec Victoria, I think it was from memory, to basically start a program that allowed everyone and anyone to play of any skill level, of any background, of any fitness, of any time commitment, um, low cost as possible, um, to jump on the pitch and have a run. So J-Ball was played with a, a bit of a larger ball than a traditional ball, played with more of ice hockey-looking sticks. They're sort of a bit flimsier, a bit softer, less uh, less injuries. Copped a few of them in the season. Busted all over the place. Um, that's probably my own fault, not anybody else's. But uh, and, and then that also opened up the door for hockey sixes, which was played with traditional stick, traditional ball, quarter field. Um, again, low commitment, short format, and open for anyone. And we divided the teams up based on skill level and experience level, and found that we had parents, grandparents. Um, People from other clubs. We had we had umpires, hockey umpires who haven't played hockey for a long time, bring their children along and play. Uh, we had mums, dads, daughters, grandparents, grandmas, everybody join in. And it was people that I'd seen at the pitch for 10, 15 years that had never played hockey because they were always busy getting the kids on the pitch or they were helping out. They just couldn't give the time. And they jumped on the pitch and had a run, and it became a really fun experience. It's now become probably one of the most looked forward to things in our summer calendar um, at hockey. We run it again, and we'll continue to run it for as long as we can um, to keep engaging people. Through that, we've basically developed, helped rebuild and develop our women's section again, which we've done really well with. We've gone from one to well, pushing, almost pushing, you know, four teams if this year wasn't so weird. Yeah. Almost would have built four full women's teams and a lot of them uh, came across from social hockey. So they tried it out, had a bit of a laugh, met some people, felt uh, a connection and then and then moved into winter sport, which ultimately that's what everybody, we want everybody to do is just to join in the community that we have and the culture we have and how do we open that up to people who may not normally be exposed to that and with the support of Sports Rec Victoria, Vic Health and, um, and and Hockey Victoria, we were able to do that. And then I loved it. Even I did. I've been playing hockey for 15 years. Doesn't mean I'm great, but um, but it was also just good to play sport in a really social short format, have a bit of a laugh, sun's going down, 8 o'clock on a Friday or Thursday afternoon, and everyone's standing around having a laugh with each other, trying to play uh, what, what is – Normally, a sport we're all very educated on, and now we're playing a modified format, which is very different. So, trying to run around and have a good time, and it was good. It became a really good social thing as well as a fitness and health thing and an engagement component of our club. And, um, you know, in yeah, a nutshell, 
Because well, a lot of the time when we talk to clubs about the intro, well, the importance of social sport, they and they, you know, most clubs of their their historical traditional format is competition, competition, yeah. Yeah. competition, competition. And we talk about well, social sport is really really important. But what you've just illustrated or experienced is bring people in through the social sport and then create that pathway for those that are interested and, and do yeah. find that they they want to progress beyond the social side into the competition and and so you your experience is that you you from that that methodology you went from one team to four teams which is potentially i mean that's that's vindication of why every yeah. club should Social yeah, sport. over over a couple of years, that program really opened up um, pathways for people to to to, to re-establish their love with a sport they haven't played for a long time, or they've watched other people, their children or their partners play. Um, and it was a slow build over a few years to get those those women's teams. We went from you know 13, 14 players. Now we've got you're pushing 40, 45 players in our women's section almost. Um, it's unfortunate we can't field them all. In, you know, hockey was one of the last sports to pull the pin. Um, they Hockey Victoria and a lot of the clubs did a, a heap of amazing work. So I should give a shout out to the volunteers and yeah. that they're putting that time, not only at Frankston, but at every single sporting club, especially hockey. We ran up, you know, right to the 11th hour, really. Um, you know, 11.59 on the, on the D-Day clock before Hockey Vic were, had to pull the pin under the, the instruction of, the government just for health and safety reasons with COVID, um, the virus making it very difficult. But the volunteers are out there san helping people sanitise, you know, wash hockey balls, keep keep the club clean and sanitising and registering who comes in, who comes out for contact tracing. It was an amazing effort. Um, and, and I think the hockey community has something a little bit different from every other sporting community. I mean, no disrespect to any other sports community, but I've been in a few different ones. And I, I really feel like hockey people are resilient they won't take no for an answer they will find a way to play hockey um in any circumstance and we were you know so close to making it happen and then unfortunately had this second sort of wave or this influx of cases come up which meant that we um we had to sort of lay down our arms and and stop fighting the the almost impossible fight and just have a season off but hopefully we can get back on the pitch you know before the season's end and um get those engaged people, the newly engaged people from modified sports into a, a whatever regular season we can put together. Well, let's go back to, I'm, I'm really interested in the J-ball particularly, you, there was two kind of target groups. One, those bringing people back to the game, but also bringing mm. people to the game for the first mm. time. Look at it. Look at it through their eyes. What were they feeling? What were their experiences? What were their anxiety when they're kind of stepping on the pitch for the first time to play? What us non-participants could look as be quite an intimidating sport, hard ball being flown around everywhere. So, how did you take people on the journey from, you know, from the couch to having a crack and? And, and what was the format? So, and how are they feeling? And that's about 20 questions. So I'll stop and let you go. Um, how are they, how, I, I can't really speak, you know, in, in specifics about how they were feeling. But but if you watch, we've got some, you know, there are some videos that uh, Hockey Vic shared around sort of just some brief interviews, video interviews with, with players on a night that we were doing it. You know, everyone, everyone's smiling, everyone's laughing. You know, even I've got my ugly mug on there having a bit of a laugh. Um, it was just... It's it's weird. It sounds cliche and tacky, but it's a real joy to be a part of of something like that. And 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 that's really what community sport, whether it be hockey, football, tennis, rugby, soccer, golf, whatever it is that you play, that's what community sports about. Just having somewhere to be now, outside of your nine to five, outside, or if you work weird night shift, outside of night shift, outside of weekends, you can not be a mum or a dad or an employee or a brother or a sister for for forty five minutes, maybe half an hour, and just have fun. Just let your hair down. Enjoy it. Make a fool of yourself. You know, I guess it's probably daunting to come on to the pitch for the first time. But like anything, once you do it once, um, you you know, take the training wheels off and you have a bit of fun. So we, we in terms of retention rate from that, I guess that probably speaks volumes to the to how they felt. It was a quite a high retention rate, quite a high return rate. The program grew over a couple of years and got bigger and bigger. Uh, and, a, and quite a large portion of those players ended up playing in a, in a winter season, of, which I would say a regular season, um, through either a Monday night 
Peninsula Women's Hockey Association that's down on the peninsula there. We have a number of clubs who enter teams on that on a Monday night, and that's it's not it's, it's a women's association for hockey, but it's not played on the weekends. So a lot of them went into that, which is sort of which is at that entry level, um, still competitive though, and then went through to then the, the standard Hockey Victoria um, home and away season from there as well. So that um, that retention level, I guess, speaks volumes to how they feel. And, and I guess if you're in maths or you're in public policy, data doesn't lie, and the data doesn't say anything negative. It was uh, really good data, and if you look past data and look at people, people are playing hockey we had more more than ever uh, and that's that was our goal just to get people off the couch get healthy have a laugh and just just enjoy yourself yeah and if you look at the you know for me I'm a a practitioner that looks to create models that can move from club to club because people mm -hmm. don't have not replicable it's the processes that are and so if you look behind the process, you've got a, an introductory, really social, really fun, teaches the skills, modified equipment in J-ball. Then if people want to, they can move to then the, the, the hockey sixes, which again, social competition, come when you want, don't come when you want. You know, the person's in control of that. It's still very social. And then if you want to, there's the next step, again, for a lot of sports, you go straight from social to pure competition, which is a step too far. But as you mm. said, you created the midweek competitions, which is a lower standard, lower intensity, still high levels of fun. And then if you do want to continue, you then can go into those competitive formats. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, a pathway. Um, a pathway. Uh, but now importantly, I think probably down as well, because as you said, you were coming back and the players were coming back and playing in the in the other formats as well. Yeah, yeah, we had you know men's and women's first players, you know, who've some brilliant skill from all different age groups that wanted to join in just for fun. They'd played competitive sport their whole life, and come I guess come summer, just want to have a laugh, and then you know have a, have a giggle on the field, have a laugh off the field, make fun of each other, you know, a bit of banter, a bit of friendly friendly joking around. Um, as you run around with a, a rather floppy hockey stick and a ball that's probably double, triple the size of a normal one. Um, you're running around with your mates where you might not normally have that yeah. opportunity because they yeah. might not be the level that you are. You don't yeah. get the opportunity to play with your friends where you do in these formats. Yeah, you had teams with, um, you know, mums and dads and, and sons and daughters all on the same team, um, all joining in, having a laugh. So it was, it was something different which was good and it was just a bit of a shake up to the set to the standard sort of community sport model and having a pathway from you know laugh community engagement to something a little bit more serious but still community engagement and still a laugh into then an entry level competitive season and then you can work your way up if you wanted to or if you just wanted to happy to play a casual game here and there it gave that opportunity which we didn't really have that before it was sort of finish your juniors or, or come along and play, just jump straight into a team. And then you can be the potentially an 18-week season. Um, you know, if you're lucky enough to play finals, you're looking at that 20 weeks. Um, yep. But you may and – that, and that was probably deterrent for, for a number of people. Uh, yep. So even now, I think my wife <laughs> isn't so fond of how long it goes for at hockey, but – um, but she also supports everything I do at hockey, which is good. I will give her a shout-out. Um and for me, if that's me, you know, young family, uh, wife in uni, then there's probably plenty of people out there that are much busier than I am with much larger families than I am, much more responsibilities and commitments that haven't had the opportunity to play sports. So this was our opportunity to give them an opportunity and um, it really worked well. And Hockey Vic did it again and then we sort of have every intention of doing it again as long as this, we can get a, get a handle on this virus. So everyone stay at home, wear a mask, look after each other so we can all play sport again. Yeah, and... Um if we just kind of start to, to wrap it up, so one of the things when we're talking to clubs, the big resistance is um, it's it's another burden. There's no benefit to offering the social format. So what would you what would you say to those clubs that uh, that about the benefits of offering the social format, the time, the effort, and creating that pathway? What are those those benefits that you've found? Bigger, ultimately, clubs need players to continue to operate. It's as simple as that. You need you need to have players 
coming through the programs. You have things like, I think back in the day when I was a kid, it was Milo Cricket, um, Auskick for AFL. There's tennis. There's the Audi was supporting a soccer program there. They're essentially um, community engagement programs for split and modified versions of AFL, you know, soccer or football. Don't, don't offend any, any football fans out there, NRL, cricket, whatever it is you, you play. They're modified formats and they're, they're there to to engage people and at a very young age and teach some basic skill and get some interest. And those players end up playing AFL or they end up playing for Hyundai A-League or wherever it might be these days. It's, it's the same thing, but it's just for everybody else. You've got to have multiple avenues for people to try your sport and work out if you love it. And it's not the be-all and end-all of every you know, sporting code or club out there, but we need members to feel the team and, and how do we expose ourselves to as many people as possible to then build a bigger and better happy family club and that is to, to open up avenues for anyone of all age all backgrounds ethnicities um, you know gender preferences indigenous or not or immigrants or not how, how can, doesn't matter who you are how can we open this sport up to you and let you know that we, we welcome you um, we, we want you to be a part of our family and we want you to feel safe at our club you don't have to commit too much. You just got to rock up and have a laugh and see if you like it. And if you do, you'll probably end up sticking with us for life. You know, we're playing with players that have been playing for 50, 60 odd years. Uh, I won't name names because they'll come and get me eventually. <laughs> uh, they look a bit younger than they are, but we're players that have been playing for, for far longer than I've been alive. Once you're in, you're in. And the benefit of hockey, uh, we'll give hockey a plug here. It's, there's no tackles. There's no screamers. As, as glorious as they may be in the AFL, there's no screamers. The risk of getting those physical injuries and you know, dislocating a shoulder or tearing an ACL are quite minimal. So you tend to play hockey from a very young age to somewhat a very, very uh, a mature age is what I'll use. I believe yep. uh, Mary Lofthouse, she was with Hockey Victoria, uh, worked for Hockey Victoria for a long time. She had a thousand odd games, I think, in the end before she retired out there at, um, up at Thames. Thousand odd games. If you know how many football players can say you've played a thousand plus games? Yeah, it's huge, isn't it? So if yeah. I'm if I'm a club that's thinking of listening to you and going, well, that's that's huge. The the benefits of of introducing social sport. Um, what, what would be the tips that you would be giving those those clubs that uh, as they start on this journey? Do it. Um, tip number one: do it. Tip number two. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge to get started. Uh, don't shy away from it. If you have one person that rocks up to your, you, you know, if you, I guess if you're afraid of, oh, someone might not turn up, who cares? Who cares if no one turns up? If one person turns up, that's one person that you never spoke to about the sport that you love prior to that them walking in the gates of your facility. They've got friends. They'll tell somebody else. And then we went from, you know, very few numbers to an increase through word of mouth. Somebody bought their friend or their work colleagues. Uh, we had a couple, uh, a young couple come along last summer, just gone, and they bought a few of their friends in the second week and they bought one of their friends the week after. So by mid-program, we had turned two in, two, two um, participants into almost seven, seven or eight participants. So... Out of nowhere, it became something for everybody. So it's just you've just got to get into it. Um, be open-minded about the suggestions that come through. Not everybody um, has a natural sporting gift. I know I don't. I play with players that are much younger and much better than I am, and I wish I had their natural ability, but I do it because I love it. And if you can get someone to love your sport or just love to be in that environment, even just to be around a club where it's a family away from a family, if you like, that will make a big difference. Um, and, and the first year was hard. It was the unknown. The second year, we were more prepared. We had a bit of a process. Hockey Vic was uh, really supportive in us, helping us develop that process and how we market that to the wider public. And we'd just gone through a, a club refresh in terms of uh, rebranding, a new logo, new uniform, uh, new culture, new set of values that we really wanted to embody. So everything was big changes for us. And it was just another change that we brought in. It was through chance. It wasn't through design, um, but an opportunity came up for us to try something different. And I guess if, if, you know, if you're in business, you diversify your income streams, so you're, you're more resilient to difficult times like we're in now even. Um, we just diversified our engagement um, plans and, and where we can get members from and how we can bring people into the community that it is the greater hockey community, not just, you know, if they end up playing for another club, 
you know, I love them to play for Frankston, but they play for another club. Well, they're still playing hockey. That's the sport that I love. You know, we're, we're men's and women's. We're constantly one or two in terms of the on the world on the world stage. So if we're bringing more people into that, we're going to stay the best. And um, you know, I'm proud to say that that I am a hockey player, and I'm proud to say that I'm a stingray. Always have been, always will be. And um, if anyone's watching and you want to give it a crack, here's my little plug. Come along, <laughs> come along Thank and give you. it a go. Up and running. Mate, that's that's why you're the uh, the the vice president, the inclusions ambassador, the men's coordinator, and obviously the barbecue coordinator. Because this is the barbecue coordinator. The barbecue is the- coordinator. You might have to. You might. I think uh, Maddie Hurst might have a bit to say, or Dennis might have a bit to say about that one. But I'm going to claim it until they say otherwise. <laughs> Uh, that's fine. Now, if we just, in summary, if I just pull up the the Vic Sport, the the um, the framework that Vic Sport have developed with La Trobe University, with the six principles that really help clubs uh, introduce new participation options for sport, and you can you can get all the access to this information at doingsportdifferently.com.au, and the resources are, are brilliant. But just highlighting a couple of the principles, uh, Chris, that that. That principle number five, needing a, a clear pathway for retention or transition as their skills, fitness, interests in change, I think either develop or come back down the scale a bit is is been a, to me a really key part of it, as well as the fact that you engaged. What what you did, you didn't reinvent the wheel, and I love that. The so many peak sporting bodies have got the, done a lot of the work where they've engaged target markets, and they've they're looking at things through the participation pers- participants' perspective, creating those formats that, as you say, create the fun, the enjoyment, and the outcome that that we're looking for. So, um, you just you're a living, breathing. Oh, Frankston Stingrays Hockey Club is a living, breathing example of why these principles were were created so clubs and sports could follow them so chris fantastic effort and um thank you very much for being part of the sports community live stream and and sharing the story of your club with with all of us today no thank you very much and um you know thanks for having me and thank you for everyone who you know in any code participates and, and volunteers and helps out any sporting sporting coding club you, you all do a great job and community sport wouldn't be what it is without volunteers. So take my hat off to the volunteers and, and all the supporters. So thank you very much. And there's a good opportunity to talk to you about it. And hopefully uh, we can get all get back to playing the sports we love in uh, in a matter of weeks. Now, Chris, before, before you go, we've, I mean, I was, I was remiss of me not to invite um, the audience to, to participate with questions and, and, um, and their experiences as well. So, Rachel uh, is, has asked the question, how do you go about introducing new roles to your club volunteers? Did you need to recruit more or less than the extra work? What a, what a great question, Rachel. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, it's a very good question. The challenge of, of community sport sporting clubs is who has the time to do what and where do you find the time between being a mum, dad, brother, sister, partner, husband, wife, CEO, bricklayer, student, where do you find the time to do the things that are required for 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 a sporting club to operate. And for us, we had a really good opportunity just prior to this. So things sort of fell into place just prior to this where we had restructured our club. We had done things the same way for a long time and it worked quite well. We wanted to really modernise the way we did things and ensure we don't burn our volunteers out because that's the biggest challenge with sporting clubs is you end up with someone doing almost everything and then a handful of people pitching in to help that person out. So we really looked at it at a business perspective and separated and said, how would a business operate? What does it, what does a president of a business do or a CEO? They delegate, they support, they help direct. They don't physically get out there and you know sell the products their company sells. They support and they direct the organization. So we had that, we took an organizational structure. We looked at what roles were really important um, and who had the experience, whether it be hockey experience or business experience. We had, uh, you know, Monica jumped on as a, a child protection safety officer. So how do we make our, our place safe? How do we engage policy? How do we make it the most robust place sporting club we can have without being too bureaucratic? And that was to find people with skill sets within the business. Uh, our treasurer, Helen, has done an amazing job. She's, you know, an accounting background, I think, to some degree. If not, she should be. Um, she's done an amazing job. So we found people with skill sets that were and we spoke to them and said, we would like your help. Uh, we'd really love if, if you could give us a hand. Some people fell into those roles naturally. Some people 
required a bit of, um, uh, I guess, pushing a square peg through a circle hole. Um, but but they once they got to the other side, it was really they really enjoyed it. And in terms of creating new roles, I guess too too many chefs make a bad broth. Uh, that's as simple as that. You, we, we created a role as we needed it. We'd never had a child safety protection office before. We never had a community community engagement officer before. But we we had to have a, a reason why we wanted it. Why did we want that role? What was the outcome? So process, measurement, outcome. What was it that we were trying to achieve and did that warrant another person, another volunteer, you know, us asking someone to give up their time? They're not non-paid positions. So... We've, I guess justifying that to a volunteer, saying this is the benefit for our club, this is the benefit to you doing it, and we'd really appreciate your time, that sort of fell into the organisational structure. In terms of sort of new roles popping up, I just took on, I guess I'd take on a role and understand the time commitment that was involved. So the community, uh, the inclusion ambassador role, that's something that we've got a couple of members that want to do that role now that, um, you know, are active within the LGBTQI community. Uh, and and would probably be better suited to that role with those connections within the community. And this year they were going to hand over, but it didn't quite happen because of COVID-19. But I took the role on, understood what it was, what it entailed, the time, so then I could pass that information on to the next person. And we had a bit of a document, a bit of a running sort of uh, policy, if you like, or, or, or process about what it is the person does, what it is they need to do, the time and that it takes, um, and our expected outcome and the support channels available to you within the club. And that enabled us to then really set in a strong structure um, to build and then have people look for different opportunities to make the club bigger and better or safer and happier and stronger. Yeah. And that, just, that was a very long answer to a very short question. And just to probably add one little thing to that, when we find it's less about skill set um, when we're looking for people because often people don't have that skill set but mm. and more about having an interest in that area mm. that we're about ask them to do so if someone's got no kids then really they're the right person to ask for um helping with kids and like vice versa it's not necessarily say that young mothers would be overly interested in helping set up a master's program for instance yeah no, yeah spot on that's probably a caveat that, that we should mention is that um, just because you're an accountant doesn't mean you want to be an accountant on the weekends for a hockey club or a treasurer. Just because you're a, a CEO, you may not want to be a president for a sporting club. I've got, um, you know, I, I'm not within the LGBTQI or the Indigenous or the dis disabled community. I don't come from that, that those sectors. Um, but taking on the role was about educating myself um, about those communities, why they're feeling uh, I guess, segregated or, or compartmentalised and how do we break down those walls? For me, it was an education process that I learned a lot out of uh, and I thank all those who gave me their time and, and and were patient with me to understand, to better understand what it is to really embody those values and not just virtue signal, not just slap a logo on your shirt and say, oh, we, we, we do all this cool stuff. It's about what it is to really live it and breathe it. I wasn't the, I may not have been the best fit for the person, for that role at the time, but I was definitely open-minded enough to want to take that on. And, and it was also a bit of a self-awakening journey, if you like, and not to sound too tacky or cliche, but it was about me learning and opening up my mind to the broader communities that exist within our large community and, and, and offering them a safe space to, to, to participate in sport. So, you know, it may not be that, you know, someone may be a bricklayer. It doesn't mean they want to lay bricks and build your clubhouse. But if you ask them, they might want to be a treasurer. They might want to be a safety officer. They might anything. Umpire. Just ask people and, and let them know, be clear about the time involved and give them realistic time frames and realistic involvement levels. Don't say, oh, it's two, three hours a week and then they're spending, you know, 18 hours a week. That's not that's not how clubs or, or communities, um, organisations thrive Sorry. you've got to be very clear about it and if people understand what they're in for and they've got that they just want to be involved they'll do it and they, they will do it willingly that's how i started out i had zero knowledge about how to, to assist in running a club or how to run a men's section or how to open up our club to the broader communities but i learned and i had passion for it and i wanted to do it and i believed in what we wanted to achieve as a club and as a family and um, and that led me down a path where i could learn more and, and understand more about what i'm trying to do through education and um, now I have a better skill set that benefited me both on you know weekend sport and also in within the work environment as well um, 
professionally. I, I got a lot out of it professionally as well. So there, there's a plug for being a volunteer. You get free training for something that can help you out in your workplace. Uh, very good, Chris. Well, Chris, we could talk for hours, and to be fair, we nearly have. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being part of uh, this health, uh, Vic Health um, supported program, doing sport differently. Your club is almost the poster club of the benefits of, of creating opportunities for people not currently participating and and the value that it creates. So, Chris, and to the Franks and Stingrays Hockey Club, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today on Sports Community Live Stream. Thanks for having me. Get out there, play sport, folks, and um, look after each other. Brilliant, Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah. And to everyone else, thank you very much for being part of this live stream and being part of our sports community.